Welcome to Establishing Shots, the podcast about the art, craft and business of filmmaking. I'm Nick Hilton. So this week my guest is Morgan Neville, the Academy Award winning director of 20 Feet from Stardom, Best of Enemies and now Will You Be My Neighbour, which is a documentary screening at the London Film Festival at the moment about the life of Fred Rogers, known in America at the very least as Mr. Rogers and his famous TV show Mr. Rogers' Neighbourhood. We're partnering on this episode with the great film site Cineview, which if you don't already know is is one of the top British film websites for reviews and features looking at a range of films from independent films, art house films through to all the blockbusters and amazing festival coverage at the moment obviously their LFF stuff is well worth checking out. That's all available at cine-view.com. That's C-I-N-E-V-U-E.com. I sat down with Morgan to discuss his new project and how documentaries are forming in a very political climate in 2018. Here's our conversation. So, Morgan, you're here in London for the London Film Festival, where your film, Won't You Be My Neighbour, is exhibiting is in competition uh it's not it's not um the lff has been my go-to festival i didn't even really realize it's been kind of the number one festival in my career i've had 11 films at the wow. lff wow. but this one came out um some time ago in the u.s I uh, it came out this summer in in the u.s it premiered at sundance and it's coming out here in the uk in november so it was a huge hit in america and Mr. Rogers, who it's about, is a huge figure, the most famous children's television host in American history. And nobody in the UK knows who he is. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll get to <laughs> okay. my concerns about the UK market in, um, in a second. Just Can you just give me a brief summary of how this film came to be? It's a slightly unusual subject for a documentary. It is. Um, you know, he was a kind of eccentric children's television host for 33 years. And, you know, virtually everybody in America knows him. Um, but he was somebody who was actually this incredibly wise, willful person who was trying to kind of teach kids how to deal with the traumas of the modern world. And in a way, as an adult, it's a film about how we are all supposed to deal with the traumas of living in the world we live in today. You know, so his grand metaphor of the world was the neighborhood, you know, which is our society and our community and, and how we should live as good neighbors. So he's kind of an advocate for civility at a time where civility is very, very rare. But why now? Why this Why this moment? To... Well, I mean, because, I mean, for me, it was the instinct of going back and rediscovering him as an adult and feeling like this voice doesn't exist in our culture. You know, the, I, I've been saying for years, you know, I, I've find that there are no grown-ups anymore in our culture and um how do you get a kind of adult voice who can advocate for civility and um empathy and these other things you know right now and i don't know how to how to do it otherwise you know that it was it was just the sense of i want this voice in our modern culture in 2018 it wasn't about going back it was about going going ahead and trying to figure out how how I could put something positive in the world. You know, it's such a dumpster fire right now. That, was, uh, that was, was it a hard was sell it. For, for financing? Were people it really actually, on board with the idea? It was actually the easiest sell of my life, funny enough. Because I my pitch was I want to make a film about radical kindness. And everybody I pitched it to said, I want to help. Yeah. It was honestly the easiest film I've ever had putting together and they all grew up with Mr. Rogers so they were all some did some didn't but they all knew him you know everybody in America knows him but they all I think more importantly understood the need for this kind of message to be out there in the world so you you're now in England no one here knows Mr. Rogers really yeah. I grew up I partly grew up in the US so I grew up with Mr. as a very old man Mr. Yeah. Rogers and for me it was just this very I describe it to English friends as you know this man who would come home and take off uh, put on a cardigan and no no one can <laughs> understand what it, you know children's TV is weird but the Mr. Rogers thing was as I remember it was really weird but no really no one here knows Mr. Rogers how, no. how are you how are you going to sell this documentary to them well 
it's interesting because I, you know, when I was making the film, I wasn't thinking, how's it going to translate overseas? But I know from Sundance through the festivals we've done and through screenings I've done for BAFTA and other people um, that I've had many, many, many um, Brits and others who had no awareness of him um, come out of the film saying they were profoundly moved by it. I mean, I think the, the big themes translate which is, you know, this kind of humanist world point of view of, you know, how do we, how do we remind ourselves of, of, um, our, our better angels. And Ian, I feel like a, a British audience, for instance, gets into it differently. They have zero nostalgic connection to it. So the beginning of the film plays differently, but I feel like very quickly a British audience kind of, finds the groove with it. I mean, what's interesting is in England, most people expect their children's presenters to have um, dark <laughs> underbellies. Mm. <laughs> and so I think there's a certain amount of s- skepticism um, from a British audience. But, you know, including the, the screening I had last night at the LFF, uh, it was an incredible screening. You know, it played incredibly well. So, you know, uh, I'm just happy that people here can can have some awareness of it. And I think it really is. I mean, the, the film is famous in the States for being the film that makes you cry, mm. <laughs> but, but it's the thing about the film is it's not sadness. It's, it makes you cry because it's goodness. You know, I think Roger Ebert had said he was always more moved by, by goodness than sadness, you know? And, and I think it's a film about that, about somebody who's doing something kind of truly, profoundly good yeah i mean you alluded to it briefly there that we've sort of undergone a national self-examination of our you know public figures and i guess the u.s to an extent sure people like bill crosby and so forth the way the documentary plays you sort of i sort of partly expected i knew that there wasn't the twist coming but you sort of think oh gosh because he's an unusual guy and you sort of Mm -hmm. and i guess during his lifetime there was a lot of probably gossip about him and seemed apparently largely unfounded Mm -hmm. but just because his manner was so unusual and and i wonder whether you feel like he somehow feels uncomfortable to to be honest, in the in the modern way where you can't really touch other people's children, you can't really say I love you to other people's children. Somehow yeah. that feels quite dated. Maybe it's maybe it's a British thing, maybe it's um just a time. Maybe. I think it's to me, uh, you know, somebody described the film as um watching this movie as like freebasing sincerity, <laughs> which I thought was a uh, quite a line, quite a pull quote. Um but there's something about somebody who's so emotionally open and sincere in this day and age where everything is ironic, you know, our superheroes are ironic. And so to have somebody do that, I think actually says way more about us than it does about them as a subject. I think it says, you know, where are we as a culture where it's hard for us to take somebody who's sincere and openly emotional and caring and kind and not think of those things as kind of trite, and, um, you know, or that there's a, a secondary agenda to them. And that's kind of what I wanted to do with the film is ultimately the film becomes a mirror. You know, what's it say about us that we think all these things? As a documentarian, were you ever at all frustrated that there wasn't that slight edge on which you could maybe, you know, hang some conflict in the film? I know, I, you know, there was this there's this question about his relationship with homosexuality. Mm-hmm. And I, you have Francois Clemens, is it, mm-hmm. who speaks in the film about it and speaks very compassionately about Fred Rogers' attitude towards him. Yeah. But at the same time, there was this him saying, you can't come out and also be part of the neighborhood. Yeah. Was it in a way unhelpful that, you know, people around him were, you know, not blaming him for these sort of things? There was this sort of, I wondered whether you were worried it ever became too hagiographical. Yeah, I mean, in fact, when I started making the film, his widow, Joanne Rogers, said to me, don't make him do a saint. Because the thing is, if ever there's a saintly figure in American culture, it's probably Mr. Rogers. I mean, he's thought of as this kind of, you know, he's thought of hagiographically. So I think talking about both his shortcomings in terms of thinking about things like homosexuality or accepting that, which changed over the years, or him as kind of a struggling artist and how much he, how much profound insecurity he had, I think help me think of him as a real person and not not a um not just a saint so you know i think i think that 
he was somebody who it's it's tough to explain to, to somebody here, but it's it's somebody who um, I think actually affected certainly affected who I became as a person and millions of other people in a way that I don't think we can ever understand because most of us who watched him had a relationship with him before we were even even had memories. You know, it's kind of in our oldest, deepest part of ourselves. Um, and I think that's, that's something we don't think a lot about, which is kind of the first principles of how we should behave as people is what he was essentially trying to teach us. I mean, he was a minister and his teachings came out of, you know, Christian theology, but he also studied, you know, Islam and Judaism and Buddhism and kind of pulled the common humanist values out of all these world's religions and put them together into the show without ever talking about God or anything like that. And I feel like that playbook is pretty much how we should treat another person, you know, that what he's advocating is kind of a global humanist world point of view, which is to me kind of exactly the message I want to be putting out there in the world. And the tension in the film really becomes between him and the world that doesn't care. You know, does the world care about being good or does it, does it just care about thriving? Hmm. Do you think of this as a family film? Do you, I mean, I don't know whether documentaries somehow feel a hard sell to children, um, but but I would imagine this has played quite well across you know age ranges. It has, but it's not. I mean, in the states, they rated it PG thirteen, right. which is for, for what for what was what were they pulling up there? Um, you know, adult oriented content. You know, a few kind of light swearing right. Uh, right. words in there. Um, I was surprised by that rating. So it's not, you know, for five-year-olds. I mean, there's a lot of heavy content in there. I mean, it, it, we should say that, you know, in this show he was doing for two- to six-year-olds, he was dealing metaphorically with things like war, mm. AIDS, starvation, nuclear holocaust, you know, that he was dealing with very serious issues in a kid's show mm. with puppets. That, that sequence from, I think it's the first week of the show, which has the King Friday the 13th building a, building a wall, which you must have just, you know, seen that and been like, this is such a great piece for the film. It was perfect. And that was the, yeah, the first week of the show, exactly, is he's, you know, delivering this message of, um, of how we're supposed to build connections with other people. I mean, the whole title of the show, this idea of the neighborhood and won't you be my neighbor. I mean, it's it's an extension of love thy neighbor. I mean, it's, it's not... Um, liberal it's christian in that in its root um and i think he would argue that a lot of these values in terms of how we think about immigrants th these aren't um liberal values these are christian values this is what christ would do so i think i wanted the film to kind of put those out there and and let us have a discussion about where do we find our you know our uh, christian leadership in terms of political issues i mean certainly in the states I'm I'm kind of baffled by the positions a lot of evangelical churches take mm -hmm. on politics, which seem antithetical to the politics uh, and the uh, theology they're based on. Yeah, did you ever sort of question whilst you're doing it, Mr. Roger, I don't know your personal politics, mm -hmm. I don't want to presuppose just because you're a... Hollywood documentarian, um, <laughs> California liberal. Yeah, I, but I, but you know, he he was a minister. He was you know a Republican donor. Is that is that right? Or he certainly? was a registered Republican. You know, and that was a day and age when that there were many stripes of Republicans, particularly in Pennsylvania, where he came from. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, what they called Rockefeller Republicans, who were, I guess, a liberal Republican, if that's now an oxymoron to say. Yeah. So he is of a, of that breed. But do, do you think that Mr. Rogers becomes a sort of palatable face of sort of benign conservatism? And maybe I, I don't. I mean, I, I don't know whether you can ever be like, well, his views were were liberal within the context of being conservative, or whether you, you, I guess there's that step where you have to interrogate the essential nature of conservatism and the conservative message being propagated to children. I guess it's a matter of time. I'm sort of rambling here. Yeah, and I feel like it's an interesting discussion to have that you know i he personally had no tolerance for thinking of things in in um liberal or conservative views i mean in a way that most the, i mean um, the fact that so many people in the church um have gotten so politicized to him i think would have baffled him you know he also had no tolerance for these ideas of of um 
good and evil of judgment and scapegoating. I mean, all these things that our world is full of, you know, playing one group off against another, um, he had zero tolerance for. And that I find really refreshing. Um, and he's also a figure who has no cultural baggage. So he's not thought of it in any one way or another, you know, because children don't think of themselves that way either. So again, it's kind of, how do we get back to the, the basic things? You know, he said, you know, I don't do good and evil, you know, because it's not helpful, mm-hmm. you know, because I'm trying to understand what makes everybody tick. And I think ultimately the two things he talked about most were fear and love, you know, as being the two great opposite poles in our life, you know, and, and love is the thing we aspire to, not just love for others, but self-love and fear being the great negative force in the world that left untreated becomes things like bigotry and hatred and resentment. You know, we live in such a culture of resentment right now Mm. um, that I think that all stems from fear and from people being fearful. So in a way, this film to me (laughs) was deeply therapeutic in terms of just thinking about how we in the modern world don't process a lot of our traumas and fears and, and they come out in very unhealthy ways. Do you feel any any pressure in in 2018? I guess mm-hmm. either from studios or from critics or from, or even just socially to be maybe a more overtly political documentarian. I mean, I, I feel like 20 Feet from Stardom and this. I didn't. I confess, I didn't see the Vidal Buckley yeah. film. They're very um, you know crowd pleasers in a very good way. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the Vidal Buckley film Best of Enemies is actually very related to this because they're films which are not about, you know, that this side's right and this side isn't right. It's like, can we at least agree that we should have a place where we can come together and have real debate? Or mm-hmm. can we at least agree that we need to have grown-ups in our culture who are going to help look out for the long-term best interests of how things are going to work out? It's it's this kind of search for common ground that I often go for. And I've had a lot of discussions with my documentary peers who debate You know, how much are we just preaching to the converted with films we make? And I really wanted this film in particular to be a film that would reach people I don't agree with Mm -hmm. and to make everybody kind of ask themselves hard questions about the moral decisions we make. And I know in the States it's done that incredibly. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It actually... And reached a huge audience. Reached a huge audience in the States of people who are not coastal elites, you know, Mm -hmm. people in um, the Deep South. And I heard scores of stories about church groups, you know, doing special outings or ministers doing sermons around the film and things like that, um, which is exactly what I was hoping for, you know, because if I'm, if we're just talking to each other and preaching the converted, then, then what are we doing? Mm-hmm. You know? So for me, it's, I'm, it's just, maybe it's my nature that I'm always kind of searching for common stories that we can all kind of identify in. In a sense, that is, you know, as political a statement as, you know, as being very overtly left wing or very overtly conservative to, you know. So finally, just how are Brits going to get to see this film? And what is the sort of one thing you would say to them to sort of so they don't enter as quite as quite as virginal as they would otherwise be? I mean, again, back to what I wanted the film to be out in the beginning. It's a film about goodness, (laughs) like unadorned goodness that, you know, in the States, the film is, you know, famous for making audiences cry. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But, but I think it's, it's a film that really makes you come out of it thinking about the decisions you make in your life. And are you being (laughs) the best version of you you should be? I mean, without sounding too new agey about it, I think it's actually a film that, um, you know, it's like a good year's worth of therapy rolled into 90 minutes. So yeah, nice. <laughs> hopefully that's a good pitch. <laughs> and November? 12th. November 12th. In, in cinema uh, 12th? Or? Yeah, 9th. 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 November 9th. Early that's November. It. The Friday. And, yeah. and it will be in, in cinemas here or is going onto streaming platform? Um, it's going to be in cinemas here um, and then it will roll out into streaming platforms. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. Thanks for having me. Thank you to Morgan. And if you're interested in hearing more from us, please subscribe on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll try and be there 
And do follow us on social media. On Twitter, we're at ShotsPod or on Facebook. Just look for Establishing Shots. We've got a very active community on Facebook. And there'll be more episodes in the coming weeks. See you soon. <laughs>